Good! Hello everyone, my name is Andy and I know all of you struggle with dynamic programming. I struggle too. It's a very difficult field and involves a lot of experience and practice for you in order to get good at it. But that's why we have these videos. So, in this video I'm going to solve an example of dynamic programming problem which you are going to find on Algo Academy. It's on a free subscription. I leave you the link so you can solve it after the video if you want. So let's dive into it. I'm going to show you how I think about dynamic programming, what's my process, what's like my step-by-step uh, -step bulletproof formula of coming up with dynamic programming and I hope this is going to help you in solving further problems. So this one is called binary strings with at most k consecutive ones and basically it's very simple. We are given two non-negative integers n and k and we should return the number of binary strings, so strings containing only zeros and ones, of length n with at most k consecutive ones. So let's take a look at this example. We have n equals 4, k equals 2, and the output is 13. As you can see here in the explanation, we have 13 strings, all of them of length 4, and all of them have at most two consecutive ones, right? So we are not allowed to have three consecutive ones or even four. Awesome. So as a note here, k is less than or equal than n, which is less than or equal to 30. Okay, maybe we are going to use this in the future. So first of all, how do I come up with dynamic programming? That's the first question. How do I know that this problem is going to involve dynamic programming? Well, this is a problem which I call a counting problem, right? So all the problems which involve, you have to count something, the number of things which have property one, two, three, and so on and so forth. These are called uh, counting problems. And for counting problems, the only two ways of solving them are, first of all, you either come up with a mathematical formula I mean, for example, how many permutations of length n are there, which is n factorial? How many subsets of a set of length n exist? 2 to the power of n. So either you come up with this type of formula, or if you can't, you are going to use dynamic programming. So for this question, first of all, I can think of a mathematical formula. You can think, you can pause this video and think for five minutes. Maybe you come up with one, but it's super difficult. And yeah, at the point that you won't come up with one, there is one more trick that you can use. And that trick is the constraints. So think about this. If this problem is going to be solved with a mathematical formula, right? Something like n factorial or two to the power of n or maybe some combinations or stuff like that. Usually those formulas don't take a lot of time to be computed, right? You can use something like logarithmic exponentiation or something like that, and you are going to compute that formula in log of n or maybe O of n at most, right? So if this was a mathematical formula problem, then n would be a lot greater. n would be something like 1 million or 1 billion or stuff like that. It wouldn't be just 30, right? 30 is a small number which means that you are allowed to have a time complexity of n squared, n cube, uh, maybe n to the power of 4 for this problem, right? So, um, yeah, that's the first, that's the second, actually, hint that you are going to solve this with a dynamic programming. Awesome. Now, we know this is a dynamic programming problem. What's next? Well, when uh, solving dynamic programming problems, I have a couple of steps. Step number one. First, you will have to define your DP, your dynamic programming. Define your DP. What does this mean? Well, a DP is usually an array, which can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. You have to figure out how many dimensions you need, and then uh, you are going to define it in words. DP of i or DP of i and j will store x something right this information and we are going to see how to do that so defining your dp is number of dimensions and meaning and we are going to talk about this step later now step number two after you came up with your dp array you know what it means what you have to do is figure out how to compute it 
So this we call a recurrence relation, right? We need to come up with a recurrence relation, dp of i or dp of i and j. We need to figure out a formula, right? Depending on other dps, right? So based on other dps, like in Fibonacci, uh, dp of i equals dp of i minus one plus dp of i minus two, right? That's a recurrence relation. Cool. Step number three, after knowing how to compute your dp, this actually gets easier. You need to do the initializations. Initial, okay, perfect. Initializations, right? Hard to spell. Uh, what are those? Those are DPs that um, have to be initialized. You can't compute them based on other DPs, right? For example, in Fibonacci, right? Fibo of zero. Should it be Fibo of minus one plus Fibo of minus two? Well, these two don't exist, right? So you have to start with some uh, initialized values in your DP and based on them, all the other DP values are going to be computed, right? Awesome. So, um, yeah, basically in uh, Fibonacci, Fibo of zero and Fibo of one are initially equal to one as an example. And then starting from Fibo of two, you will be able to use the recurrence relation. And then step number four, I won't necessarily write it. It's of course coming up with the answer. After having computed all the DP array, what's the answer? How can we use it to get the actual answer, right? Cool. So these three steps are super important. I'm going to start with step number one. Here, we first have to come up with the number of dimensions and then with the meaning, right? Well, I'm gonna share with you some tricks. For the number of dimensions, what I actually do is that I start small, right? I start and try only one dimension. If with one dimension, I'm able to go through step number two and step number three and everything is fine, that means that's how I solve the problem. If not, and usually you'll get stuck with the recurrence relation, that means that you probably might need an extra information, which of course converts into an extra dimension. So let's start with one dimension in trying to solve this problem, right? How can I use one dimension? Hmm. Well, it would be dp of i that we know for sure. But what does it mean? Well, I know that the length should be n, right? Okay. That's interesting. So I can try something like number of binary strings of, let's say, valid binary strings, right? Number of valid binary strings of length i. Okay, everything is fine. Now, if I know how to compute this dp array, obviously my answer is going to be dp of n. So that should be fine. But step number two. I need my recurrence relation. How can I compute dp of i based on other dps? Or how can I use dp of i to update other dps, right? There are two ways of computing a recurrence relation, by the way. You go backwards and use some already computed values from the dp to get yours, or you use this computed dp value to update others, and in the end, those uh, dps are going to end up with the right value. Cool. So dp of i, right? Hmm. Well, that's actually a problem. When I say dp of i, the number of binary strings of length i, I know that, okay, I should have a binary string of length i, right? So let's say um, this is my binary string of length i minus one, and this is the last character. I always, by the way, in recurrence relations, I always think about the last thing, last character, last uh, house, last, depends on the problem. Here, I think about the last character. What could the last character be? Either zero or one. Cool. So if the last character is zero, right? So if I have this to be a zero, well, what's going to be the number of solutions for this scenario? Well, I know that's a zero. Okay, I have other i minus one characters, which of course could be anything, but that string should also be valid. So the question is how many valid strings of length i minus one are there? Well, I think I have a dp which already computed that, right? Which is dp of i minus one. So for this scenario, the answer is dp of i minus one. Everything is fine. Nice. But 
In the second scenario, in which I want this character to be a 1, that's a problem. Because I have a string of length i minus 1, which should be valid, but not all the valid strings of length i minus 1, when appended another 1, are going to be valid, right? Because you might have a string which ends up in k once, so 1, 1, 1, 1, for k times, right? Which is valid, nothing's wrong with it, but when you add another one, that's not gonna be correct. So this is not gonna be dp of i minus one. Hmm, but what should it be, right? Well, we can split this into extra cases, actually, or we can do a second dimension. Which one should we choose? Well, I'm going to choose uh, splitting into more cases because as you can see on Algo Academy, we have the tutorial, the video explanation and the coding tutorial for a DP with two dimensions. But in this video, I want to explain it with only one dimension because it's also possible. So first scenario, we have a zero at the end, right? Is DP of I minus one, no problem. Cool, now we have a one at the end. Awesome. Well, I'm going to think about the previous character. So I know that the last one, I want it to be a one, but now I'm going to think about the previous one. What can this previous character be? Of course, a zero or a one, right? So if it's a zero, what happens? Well, everything is fine because we have one here. If K is at least one, then this configuration is correct, right? And we have I minus two characters now, which should form a string which is valid, right? So how many valid strings are there of length I minus two? Well, I know this answer. It's DP of I minus two. And for each of these valid strings, if I append a zero and a one, it is also going to be valid, right? So this case is now solved. But what happens when the last character is one and the second last character is also one? Where we have another problem, right? Because if I say the answer is dp of i minus two, if I get some valid strings here, which end in k minus, k minus one uh, ones at the end, right? And I add two more ones, then this bigger string is not going to be valid, right? So it's not dp of i minus two. I don't know what it is. So again, I have to split it into cases, right? So I know this is a one, I know this is a one. Now I think about the third last character. This can be a zero. And if k is greater than or equal to two, then it's gonna be fine having two consecutive ones here. And then I'm going to have uh, how many characters? i minus three characters they should um, they should form a valid string of length i minus three. So I know if I take all the valid strings of length i minus three and append zero, one, one, everything should be fine. So I have a dp of i minus three. Do you notice the pattern? I have dp of i minus one plus dp of i minus two plus dp of i minus three um, um, until this point, right? Now, what's the other scenario? Of course, one here, one here and one here. Of course, the answer is not going to be dp of i minus three. Now I have to think about the fourth last character and this can be either a zero or a one. And if it's a zero, I'll have dp of i minus four. If it's a one, another case and so on and so forth, right? So I can do this stuff all the way until I reach this scenario. I have k ones. Uh, let's write it like this. Cool. I have here k ones at the end because I can't have k plus one, right? Um, and what do I have here? Obviously a zero, right? So this is the last possible scenario. And if these are k characters, these are k plus one characters. So I'm left with i minus k minus one characters, if I'm correct, right? Yeah, that should be it. So i minus k minus one characters, right? Awesome. So 
perfect. This is the last scenario, right? So I actually came up with a recurrence relation for dp of i. If we add this together, dp of i is first scenario, we have a zero here. We count all those strings, which are dp of i minus one. Plus second scenario, we have a one here, but a zero here, we count all these strings and there are a total of dp of i minus two, plus so on and so forth. Last case scenario, dp of i minus k minus one. And this is our recurrence relation. So we have defined the dp, only one dimension, that's very cool. A lot of you maybe who solved this problem knew with only two dimensions, but it's possible with one. We have found out the recurrence relation and now we have to think about the initializations. What's dp of one? Actually, I'm going to start with dp of zero. Um, when initializing dynamic programming, uh, by the way, um, what we do usually to make it easier is also initialize dp of zero. You are going to say, yeah, but dp of zero, the number of valid binary strings of length zero. Yeah, I know. Technically, there are no binary strings of length zero, right? But in theory, we think about it like this. The empty string is a binary string of lamp zero and it's valid, right? So I can initialize dp of zero with one. I can do a dp of one equals two, either the string zero or the string one, which both will be valid. And I can start with those. And uh, all I have to do next is from dp of three, use my recurrence relation. Of course, make sure that uh, you don't exceed zero, right? So what I can do here is actually have a max between this and zero because maybe um, for i for the first values of i, three, four or stuff like that, k is going to be greater than i, right? And this is going to be negative. So make sure you do this um, to not exceed the array's bounds. And yeah, basically that's it. This is how you solve a dynamic programming. So as a recap, right? Step number one, figure out it's a dynamic programming. Think about a mathematical formula because this is a counting problem. You don't uh, find one. You see that the restraints uh, are actually pretty small. You think of dynamic programming. You define your dynamic programming. Start small, one dimension. Cool, define it. Usually the definition is the same as the problem statement, right? Number of valid strings of some length. Uh, try the recurrence relation. If you find one, cool. This requires a lot of practice. There is no formula for coming up with recurrence relation. Trust me. What I do, just as a trick, as I told you, I always think about the last things, the last character that I can have in that string, the last, I don't know, day in which I bought some stock for other problem and stuff like that, right? Um, if you can come up with one, that's very nice. Make sure it's correct. If you don't, then you probably will need some extra information and I'm going to make a video on some problem which cannot be solved with one dimension. So you can see how I try one dimension and then I figure out that I need a second one. And yeah, make the second dimension, make the recurrence relation um, if needed. If not, just make the recurrence relation as I did here and then use the initializations, right? So this is the problem. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. I hope you took some value from this. And of course, if you want to code it, and if you want to see the two dimension solutions, we have a video explanation and also coding tutorial. If you get stuck coding, you can use our coding tutorial and make sure that you write clean quality code. Um, I will send you a link to Elgo Academy. In that link, you can um, you know, go on the platform, solve this problem for free, solve another five problems for free. We have six free problems. And also you'll have a discount um, in that link too, if you decide that you want to buy the premium. You are welcome. So this was it, guys. I'll see you on the next one and uh, happy to be back. Bye.